The Long Box Crusade presents... Action Film Face-Off. This episode, it's 1971 versus 2009. Two films enter. One film leaves. It's our best Michael Caines. <laughs> It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hit. Welcome to Action Film Face Off. This is a show where two random ears are selected. My brother picks an action film from one random ear. I pick one from another random ear. They do battle. There's criteria involved. Champions are crowned. Hopes are anointed. Dreams are dashed. I'm overselling it. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm Jared Albrecht. Except Obi is Death Probe. I'm joined by my co-host. It's my brother, Jason. He's known as Weasel Skull. We're both military combat vets who take our action seriously, but not too seriously. So let's have some fun. Tonight, we got a couple of Michael Caine. It's the, it's the Michael Caine special episode, Jason. It had to happen sooner or later. Let's just get it done. <laughs> so... Once we got our years last time, we realized that both of them had Michael Caine movies. And I don't know about you, Jason, but I'm here at a half blind fire. I'd never seen Kidnapped, and I had seen Harry Brown. In fact, I saw it with you uh, last time I saw it, or the only time I saw it before this. I'm right there with you, man. This is, we are dress right dress, uh, half blind fire. I also have never seen Kidnapped and watched Harry Brown with you. So there we have it. There we have it. Well, now that we've established that, we're going to score each of today's films on a scale of 1 to 10 in five categories. Those categories are the story, the overall spectacle, the best action scene, the hero, and the villain. And it's still not going to be in that order. We don't have the budget, really, to fix it, I think, is what, you know, <laughs> if we got some more Patreon members, maybe we could afford to fix the script, <laughs> but until then, we're just going to roll with it. But there will be the deduction round where up to 10 points can be subtracted from the film's total for whatever we determine is the low point of the movie. Thank you, Jason. Today we're joined by a sniper, and the sniper has just one point to give in each category, so the sniper can sway the scoring by a total of five points. It is our quarterly return. Sniper, welcome back to the show. Captain Rating Kathy Bright, the MVP. MVP. Hello, fellas. Hello, Kathy. This is the Michael Caine episode. So you told me you were prepared, and I would have to not do any editing for your answer on your top three Michael Caine films. We are timing you. I didn't say you wouldn't have to do any editing, just not as much. <laughs> for example, here. Here, yeah. <laughs> where you're going to have to do editing. Right there. They're going to be girl answers, just so you know. They're probably movies neither of you have seen. If you have, you probably did not enjoy them. If so. one of them's not Jaws the Revenge, then you're not welcome back on the show. <laughs> well, then it was nice knowing you. This is my final episode. Let's I better start. hear the Italian job in there, too. I just want to. <laughs> All right, let's have it. This is kind of a cop out. My favorite character is Alfred, but those are not my favorite movies because I prefer other Batman movies. Inception. I loved his nice. character in that. He's very down to earth. He's the voice of reason. He's the anchor kind of of the movie. Totally forgot he was in it. Yes. Very small, but I like him in that role. Um, I also love his character and Now You See Me movies, both one and two, because he plays a villain. Not used to seeing Michael Caine as a villain. And my, three, Kathy. <laughs> no, Alfred doesn't count because that's a oh, character, not a movie. Oh, yeah, edit that out then. I uh, <laughs> uh, probably, here's the girl part. He was so good in Miss Congeniality. Because he was funny, he was sassy, he was a smart ass, and he was probably the best part of that movie. So, there you go. You know what? I'll allow it. You brought the passion, you brought the reasoning, and we don't judge here on Action Film Face Off. I still don't understand why Italian Job wasn't in that list, but, you know. Those picks are just fine, Kathy. <laughs> we will allow them. Now, before our two films enter the Video Dome Arena, we are thrilled to kick off this episode with special shout-outs to our Crusaders Club members. These are the fine folks who have joined the Crusade. They get early access to special long box episodes, priority seating to be guests on shows, so much more. 
These are the folks reaping the benefits and giving some much appreciated support to the show. Alan W. Wright. Angelica Wolf. Oh. Auburn Elvis. Bill Beer. Billy D. Bradley Dello. Braxton Underwood. Clinton Robeson. Captain Entropy. Clark Westfield. Dave Collins. Battle Wagon. Eric Hodges. Eric Porter. Ezra Gallo. Gary V. Gene Hendricks. Gerald Green. Heinz K. Jason Keen. Jason Lady. Jeff Polier. Jeremy L. Jim Jarman, Jim Jarman, Jim Jarman, Jim Jarman. I hope you like Jim Jarman too. Jim Meal. Joe Thomas. John Watson. Josh Strickland. Candace Ward. Some girl named Kathy Bright. She sounds awful. <laughs> it's just full of sass. Matt and Lizzie Passo. Mark Ross. Maxwell Traver. Michael Minton. Miranda W. P.D. Devins. Paul Hicks. Rick from Jeff and Rick Present. Rob Morgan. Samantha Maney. Sean Urbanski. Spidey 67. Spreadsheet. Steve Cronin. Tim Price. Tony Pennington. And Toronto Cop. If we miss anyone on the list, we apologize. Keep in mind, we record this episode well in advance of release. If you're a recent edition, we'll add you soon. But no worries. Let us know we missed you by sending an email to contact at longboxcrusade.com. We will get it straightened out. If you're asking yourself, how do I get in on all this awesomeness to become a Crusaders Club member, just go to patreon.com slash longboxcrusade for as little as just one buck a month. You'll get access to the Crusaders Club, and we would appreciate the heck out of it. So come and check it out. All right, too much talk. Let's go ahead and collect our pension checks, take our old man medicine, and deal out some justice. Let's get back to the combat and learn a bit about the film Gladiators, about the battle for your pleasure. This episode, I was assigned the year of 1971, and I selected Kidnapped. What year did the randomizer select for you, Jason? I got 2009 and put into our video dome arena, Harry Brown. All right. It's a little cane on cane action, folks. It's important to point out this isn't Jared versus Jason. We each had to select from our assigned year, so I might very well like his selection better than mine, or vice versa. This is about us discussing some beloved action films and coming to a consensus on which one is this episode's champion. Both of these resided on my Plex, so that's how I watched them. Jason. Let's see. Harry Brown I own on Blu-ray. Kidnapped, I watched it streaming i had to download some weird channel that it was on but it was free and i can't remember the name of the channel it was probably cinema box i believe is what it was Ci- yes i think that's what it was cinema box thank you kathy because <laughs> i had to do the same thing i i watched them once on jared's plex but then i also i rewatched kidnapped was on the cinema box and yeah, harry brown was on tubi i think yeah i saw saw the cinema box and that was the only way i could find it <laughs> Yeah. Or you could pay like 20 bucks to buy it on Amazon. And no. yeah, that's a that's a bridge too far. That's a Michael Caine reference right there. Nice. All right, folks, it's time for your spoiler warning. We are going to talk all about 1971's Kidnapped and 2009's Harry Brown. If you don't want them spoiled, here's a great place to pause the podcast and come back when you are better prepared. All right, folks, let me jump in with some quick info on 1971's Kidnapped. In 1746, at the Battle of Culloden, the challenge of Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Scottish Highlanders ended in total defeat. But one man didn't know the meaning of the word defeat. Alan Breck Stewart. Listen, David. I'm a wanted man and there's nowhere between here and Edinburgh. There's a hundred miles of heather with a red coat behind every rock. When I say run, you run. And when I say hide, you hide, you understand? For our lives will be... Like a hunted deer. Katrina, run! This way. Two 
two men and a girl, brought together by the inspired pen of Robert Louis Stevenson, fighting on together against all odds. Will you stand with me? I'm with you. Am I not a bunny fighter? I've entered my name on the list of witnesses. Then dinner appear at the trial. You can do nothing for me and you'll just bring harm to yourself. Will you bring your country down to protect the life of one man? That man is innocent. And if they prove it, the country has to fall, then it has to fall. I don't want you to give evidence at the trial. I couldn't bear it. To lose you both. The horse, David, the horse, over there! Rebels with a cause, caught up in the aftermath of the last great battle on British soil. It's not over. We'll come again. Cast and crew is uh, well. You got Michael Caine, of course. Dude named Lawrence Douglas. I think Donald Pleasant showed up. It was directed by Delbert Mann. The synopsis goes a little something like this: David Balfour lives a tough life because Uncle tries to either kill him or sell him off at every opportunity, and he does get sold off. But on his ocean voyage, he meets the dashing adventurer Alan Breck. Due to the political climate of England at the time, which I never totally understand throughout this movie. David and Alan must sneak back through the countryside to reclaim David's rightful inheritance from his evil uncle, which he does. And then the movie goes on for like another 40 minutes about courtroom politics and things I simply do not understand. And here's Kathy with your trivia. I did find it interesting that they use local high school students for the extras in the early scenes with the Highlanders versus the Redcoats. Second trivia fact. According to Kane's autobiography, the cast and crew were not fully paid for this film, which came as no shock to Kane because he also mentions how he knew just a couple of months into filming that this was probably going to be a failure, which led him to drink and smoke quite ferociously during a production break. (laughs) And then third trivia nugget for this film is the boat captain, Jack Hawkins, His voice had to be dubbed because he had suffered from throat cancer, had a tracheotomy. He also wore a scarf to cover where his tracheotomy was. His voice was dubbed by none other than Charles Gray. Would either of you two fellas like to explain to the audience who Charles Gray is? Well, Mr. Charles Gray played none other than the nefarious Blofeld in the James Bond series. To right, and Kathy and I, of course, know him from our Sherlock Holmes adventures as he plays Mycroft in the Granada TV series. In fact, when I heard the character speak in this, I wasn't watching on the biggest screen. I was watching on a smaller TV back here in my room. I like had to get up all close. I was like, is Charles Gray playing the, the bow cat? Because I knew that voice. I was like, that is his voice. And I was like, but that's not him. Jared likes to rave about him in every episode of Sherlock Holmes season. You know, he's one of those rare Jason's right. He was Blofeld. And then he was, he played a smaller character named Mr. Henderson and you only yeah, live twice. twice. Yeah. yeah. So he's one of those rare kind of got to be two different guys in the Bond universe. Anyway, I get excited. Uh, back to Jason. Well, thank you, Kathy and Jared. And now I will give you the rundown on 2009's Harry Brown. I'm scared, Harry. Kids from the estate. I'm not going to take it anymore. You should talk to the police. I've already been to the police. <laughs> Bastard! Mr. Harry Brown, police. I'm sorry to have to tell you, but Mr. Leonard Atwell is dead. He was assaulted in the pedestrian walkway. I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. murder. I don't know nothing. Oh, come on. Have you got something on me? Charge me. If you don't, you've got to let me go, in yeah. You came here to tell me that. He killed Leonard. What did you lot do? Nothing. Give me any money, man. Where I'm from, someone comes to you, you need to be tooled up. I'd like to do some business. I want to go. Is she okay? Maybe we should take her to the hospital. She's my business. I don't think Harry Brown is a witness. I think he's our chief suspect. 
He was with the Royal Marines. He's killed before, sir. Tell me what happened with Leonard. <laughs> Who's Leonard? He's the man. You and your mates murdered. As far as I'm concerned, Harry Brown's doing us a favour. To them out there, it's just entertainment. You failed to maintain your weapon. Cast and crew included Michael Caine, Leonard Atwell, and Liam Cunningham. It was directed by Daniel Barber. And the synopsis... Well, basically, it's Death Wish in London, isn't it, really? I mean, if we're being honest. Yeah, I think you're done. <laughs> so, yeah, we can say Death Wish in London, or what I wrote here is, when a gang of thugs take over the projects, which is the home of Harry Brown, the septuagenarian former Royal Marine decides to take action. There's no school like the old school, and Harry has decided that class is in session. And take it away, Kathy. Kane noticed similarities to himself and Harry Brown, as they were both combat veterans just like our two fellas here. The character Brown served as a Marine in Northern Ireland, and Kane served in the British Army during the Korean War. Following the launch of this movie, Harry Brown, Kane called for the reintroduction of national service in the UK to give young people a sense of belonging rather than a sense of violence, which we saw a lot of in this film. And my super secret that I didn't write for the fellas because I wanted their reaction to this is Michael Kane was the first person to hear the completed score for the movie Goldfinger as he was staying with his good friend, Mr. John Barry. Oh, lucky dude, man. That's pretty awesome. So you went the next level on that because we talked about it way back with, on our podcast, our pop music podcast with uh, Raymond Benson. The next level on that is when he played it. Dun, dun, dun. The first thing Michael Caine said to John Barry is, that's Moon River. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but they were actually roommates isn't that mind-blowing they were apparently kane got kicked out of his apartment that he lived in with terrence stamp who yes. you may or may not know oh, yeah. they <laughs> lived together and yeah they got kicked out of their apartment so kane was already good friends with john barry so he asked him if he could stay in his extra room and barry was like sure why not and now that we have the basics on today's contestants Ladies and gentlemen, test your might. Uh, let's get ready to rumble. Fight. It's a street fight. Street fight. Street fight. Street fight. All right, folks, here we go. It's time to get into it. First of all, we got match game. We got two films, five categories. I've not seen Jason's scores. He has not seen mine. We can match up to 10 times. Kathy, you are here live. Would you like to make a guess? Match game. Five. All right, I think that's fair. It's a good plan. And speaking of scoring, just a reminder to our listening audience, this is a 1 to 10 scale, and 5 lands right in the middle. All right, if we give something a 5, that means it's good. It's okay. It's decent, made for TV, movie fair. Uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you got a good product. Uh, 4, 3, 2, 1, you got things to work on. And with that, I'm going to get in round 1. Hasta la vista, baby. Round one is the story. How engaging or original is your story? We start in 1971. Kidnapped, kind of based on a famous story. Let's hear Kathy's thoughts. First of all, let's discuss how incredibly awesome the year 1971 was. Am I right, Jason? I somehow knew this was going to You come. got it. You <laughs> got it. Best year ever. That's right. As far as story, I agree with Jared what he said in the earlier comments. It is very confusing. We all know Kathy is not the history buff that Mr. Weasel Skull is, but I do have a little backstory on this because this is very, very similar to one of my favorite TV shows called Outlander. There is a Jacobite rebellion in Outlander, so I had at least heard of the, I've heard of Bonnie Prince Charles, so I've heard of these characters, so I was a little bit familiar. I knew, I did have to do a little research to kind of figure out the true details, you know, that whole royalty thing that's... That's a whole nightmare to get involved in. Who who really is heir to the throne? But I actually found it quite engaging, probably because of the connection with Outlander more than anything. And it was interesting. I really enjoyed. You talked about the part in the courtroom. I loved that character. He was probably my favorite character in the show. 
he brought a lot of energy that the rest of the film I don't think had. But that's really my thoughts on the story. All right. Sounds like you got more out of it than I did. I can't ever keep up with the history of England. It's all like Norman Reedus and John Saxon. And I don't know. Anyway, over to Jason. <laughs> you say Norman Reedus. This is my Normans and Saxons. Did. <laughs> I just found out the difference between Normans and Saxons like six months ago because I was like getting confused reading a Robin Hood book. And I was like, I'm going to look this shit up. <laughs> That's exactly what I did with this. I went and looked up. I'm like, did the stewards really, were they really the heirs of the throne or was it the, so I did the same thing. Anyways, Jason thoughts. I didn't make the Outlander connection. That's very interesting, Kathy. That's, I'm glad we have your perspective on that. I think at the end of the day, this is a coming of age story. We're really watching our protagonist as he becomes a man at 18, trying to find his place in the world. And it is our rough, cruel world that he falls into. Like his uncle literally tries to kill him at the beginning of the story. And then, you know, we learn the whys and wherefores after that. But even that moment with his uncle teaches him something. And when he finds Alan Breck, he's immediately taken with Alan because Alan is just full of vigor and confidence. He's a great fighter. And he's a man that this young man is looking up to and aspiring to be. But the more that he follows Alan, the more Alan's flaws start to show. And Alan is is a good man in a lot of ways. And he's also a very damaged man. He's a zealot. He's not willing to give up the cause. And he starts rationalizing to himself some of the bad things that he does. In the end, I think when we see our young man, you know, finally growing up, we still don't know exactly what he's going to turn out to be. But he's really got an input from all these characters that he's interacted with. And I think Jared's right that a lot of this gets lost because it's set in this English history that we as an American audience don't really know about. And like Kathy, I kind of had to refresh my history on Bonnie Prince Charles and, oh, yeah, the Austrian Revolution was going on at this time. So England was there fighting with that. So the Bonnie Prince decides he's going to make a play for the throne and allies with some of the Scotland. And it's just kind of a, it gets to be kind of a quagmire. And that's the setting where all this has taken place. But I think if you just kind of look past it and you look at the characters and this young man's interaction and what he learns and how he grows, how he falls in love. And then he starts questioning, like, is all this worth giving up this quiet moment that I have in bed with this beautiful woman? Like, no. You know, so he starts choosing for himself. And at the end, you know, he has to make some very difficult adult choices. So that's the element I really liked about it. I'll stop there. Let's not forget how incredibly cool that um, plaid suit was that Michael Caine wore. <laughs> he, was, oh, he was the business. <laughs> All right, let's shift gears to Harry Brown in 2009. Kathy. This was tough. This was tough to watch. I enjoyed the story. For what it was, I was a little confused how this war veteran Marine became so meek and frail. He was an older gentleman, but still, I guess it was because he did talk about how he had to turn that switch off, right? But just to see him so meek and scared of these teenagers until he flipped that switch back on. But tough movie to watch, but I really enjoyed it. And like I said in the trivia, it just baffles my mind. That there are people out there that really are that violent just for the fun of it. Because that's what these kids seem to be to me. They were just doing it. It's the whole mob mentality. Like, this is fun to them. And I just, I don't understand that world at all. Wholeheartedly agree, Kathy. I, I, I probably should have put it at the spoiler warning. This is a hard movie to watch. It's rough around the edges. Yeah, I'd seen this once before with you as we talked about at the beginning of, of our podcast the thing that I caught upon the second watch that I really tuned into was the character of Harry Brown himself. Even more than the battle he's waging against these thugs with righteous reason, it's the battle that he's waging within himself is what I really focused on during this watch. There's a scene when he takes that shoebox and he's looking through the shoebox and there's everything in that shoebox that means something to him. And he goes down layer by layer. And on the top layer are letters from his wife. Then he gets to the pieces of art that his deceased daughter made for him. 
And then what's on the very bottom, buried underneath of it, is that Sykes Fairburn combat knife, that commando knife. When he gets to that, it's literally him. He buried all that stuff, you know, for his wife and lived this other life. But that was always there, buried at the bottom of the box. And those punks made him open that box. And he went deep. <laughs> and so he did. it's interesting because I kind of jokingly said it's it's a kind of a British death wish, which it kind of is. But I think what I saw in this watch was really the more meaningful. He would buried his past, but he never really dealt with it. All these tragedies that hit him, the loss of, of his wife, the loss of his friend. He had nothing and nobody left. And he went back to the thing that he knew how to do when he was young. Very interesting. I agree wholeheartedly. It is a interesting character study. Well, we shall score them. Let's go back to kidnapped in 1971. Michael Caine, one to 10, Jason. I hate to do it. Cause this is a classic for nostalgia's sake. I'll just say when I was a young boy growing up, dad used to read me these stories, kidnapped and treasure Island. And I, he'd read me stories of world war II combat pilots. And so this really struck a chord for me, but I'm going to give it a six because you have to work really hard through the history of what's going on to really truly understand what's going on. And I think it's something that may be better read than seen as a movie. There was just too much emphasis placed on the history, I think. There's a really good story, a coming-of-age story, that gets kind of buried in here. So I'm going to give it a six. Match game number one. I also gave it a six. I thought it had a real strong start. I was really engaged at the front half. And again, I just kind of checked out yeah. a bit. And then, <laughs> and then the second half of the film, I almost gave it a five because I was like, I feel like I'm in made-for-TV status here. But then I was like, eh, it's based on a famous book. And in my research, part of... The sequel, but I didn't know there was a sequel to Kidnap, but apparently it's I didn't Kidnap either, yeah. and like half of the sequel to Kid. Anyways, so I said, all right, I'll give it a six. Let's shift gears and go to Harry Brown, Jason. I'm going to give Harry Brown a seven. I think I might have given that that a six if I'd only watched it once and just been like, oh, it's kind of a Death Wish knockoff. But when I paid deeper attention to the character this time, just the psychological trauma he's going through and how he's dealing with it. At the end, I'm going to land on a seven here. Match game number two. I also have it at a seven. So right now, Harry Brown's got a little bit of a lean on kidnapped. Kathy, better story for your sniper bullet. In conclusion to what we've discussed, the story of kidnapped, it's difficult to follow because I was focusing on Michael Caine's role. But as Jason discussed, is actually Belfour. It's truly the movie about him. So it is confusing because you're like, it does seem kind of like two stories put into one. Harry Brown, definitely more linear, more action packed for action film face off. So I'm going to give my sniper bullet to Harry Brown. And that will conclude round one. Some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate up here. All right. Well, I'll take us into round two, which is the hero. And we're going to talk about the coolness of the hero. And we'll go ahead and we'll start with Kathy, the hero. Balfour from Kidnapped. What are your thoughts there? I enjoyed him. I like the way he stood up to the guy with the wig. The or, magistrate? Yeah. I love the way he stood up to him in that room where he's like, you're going to let your whole country down to save this man's life. And he goes, if the country needs to fall to save this one person, yes, that's what I'm going to do. So like you said, by the end of the movie, he, even though he was 19, he was... I would not have had the conviction at 19 to do that. <laughs> I'd be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go back and I'm going to reset. And you're right. I'm not going to get involved in this. And I think the actor was very good. I don't know him from anything else. I didn't recognize him either. I enjoyed his portrayal in, in this movie. Well, let me push a little bit, bit on that, that scene. I enjoyed that scene as well. And what it really spoke to me was there's a simplicity. And those of us who have raised teenagers, Jared, we know that there's a there's a single focus, like there's a black and white, a right and wrong that the youth have. And he brings that forward. And we see it several times, like his disdain when Alan actually sits down to play cards, which is a sinful game, right, in his mind. And he's got this absolutist conviction. 
But the magistrate, in my opinion, and this is where I'd like you to weigh in, also has a point. Somebody has to hang for this crime. And whether I got the right man or the wrong man, if I don't hang somebody, there's going to be a revolution and more bloodshed. So is it better to hang one maybe innocent man to save thousands? And that's kind of the lesson that he's wrestling with in the third act of this movie. See, I don't feel like he wrestles with it at all. You I don't think, think so? I don't think so. To me, he didn't question it. When he asked him that question, he was like, absolutely. Like, he didn't even pause. Well, in that moment. But what yeah. about when he goes in and he talks to the man that was going to be hanged, his girlfriend's father, his girlfriend's father, and he said, don't testify against me, dummy, because thousands of people are going <laughs> to die. My daughter's going to be, be a potential victim. I'd rather hang than have that happen. When I he think truly sees the faces of the people that it will impact versus, I mean, yeah. <laughs> And then the third is when she comes out and she says, I don't want you to testify because I know I'm going to lose my father. I don't want to lose you, too. And he's struggling in that moment. And we never know what he's going to do, because in the end, Alan does the noble thing and turns himself in. Yeah, you're right, because he thought he was doing the right thing. But if the person you're trying to do the right thing for tells you to do just the opposite, it does leave you conflicted. All right. I had to push a little bit on this one because I, I thought that was one of the, the big growing moments of Lad Balfour's progression into manhood here. But anyway, I talked too much. Jared, what are your thoughts? Uh, I'm going to ignore him. Just focus on Michael Caine. He did real good, and he's charming, and he's fun to watch. I can't push back on that. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> I don't care if he's drunk and smoking all the time. He did a great job. <laughs> I mean, you make Super a good point, though, about the movie. Like, it's David Balfour's story. But when I think of the hero of this movie, I'm always going to think of Michael. I mean, he's big on the poster. Absolutely. You know, so it's just, it's tough. I mean, David's cool and all, but Michael Caine is the sizzle. Well, and he's the one that pushes the story forward. I mean, if he had not done what he did at that house, it would have been done then. Or on the ship, which we will talk about. Oh, that's yeah. my favorite part of the movie. <laughs> I think we all know what the best action scene is going to be. Yes, we, I think you're right. We, do I even have one other than that? Uh, I, well, nothing worth mentioning. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about Harry Brown. Who played that? Oh, yeah. Michael Caine. <laughs> all right. Kathy, what are your thoughts on uh, old Michael Caine and uh, Harry Brown? You yeah. wouldn't think at his age. I'm assuming he was mid 60s at this point. 76. When he made this movie? Yes. Oh, wow. For a man of 76 years old to do what he did <laughs> in this movie, there's no words. I mean, he played both aspects of his personality incredibly well. I bought him as meek Michael Caine, who was a little old scared man. And I also bought the ex-Marine who's going to do some damage to these bunch of thug kids. Yeah, I thought he did a really good job portraying both of those sides as well. Let's hear what Jared has to say. What are your thoughts here, Jared? Kind of largely what you said in the last round. I thought they added some levels and layers. And, you know, you alluded to Death Wish. And there's actually a lot of similarities there. Because before canon gets a hold of the sequels to <laughs> Death Wish, the original, everybody thinks Charles Bronson is a shoot him up guy. And he struggles with it. He vomits yeah. about killing his first dude and cries about it. And, yeah. This is kind of the sequel to, to, to Death Wish to that character, you know, before the 80s really toughened him up, you know, with Charles Ross and all. But, but focusing on Michael Caine in this, Jason, you mentioned a great scene where he goes through the box. The other standout scene for me that definitely added a point to this, what could be a stereotypical revenge character, was when he um, shoots the bad guy from Mission Impossible 5 in the stone. Well, oh, that's stomach. where I saw him before. Yeah. <laughs> He shoots that dude in the stomach and he takes the opportunity to tell a story that's been weighing on his soul his whole life because he knows the guy's going to die. He's just like, I, he's, you could just tell he's wanted to let that out for forever. And, yes. And it's really amazing and touching the way he does it. And then the way he finishes that speech with, should have helped the girl. Yep. <laughs> I was just like, man, whew, that was some legit acting right there. So that's what sealed it for me. And that's what's going to give him a pretty good score. Nice. No notes. I agree 110%. So let's go back and score them. Jed, what are you giving Alan Breck and maybe the kid? 
Yeah, I, you know, I'll combine them, of course. And I'm six. I'm good at a six for that that duo. Yeah, match game here. Yeah, I was, uh, it's a good thing Michael Caine was in this movie. <laughs> we'll just leave it there. To me, the standout scene for that is in the end when he's when he's wrestling with his decision to go back and turn himself in, and he's looking out over the fields, and all he can see are the dead bodies from all the past battles. That was powerful. All right, Harry Brown. Who are we giving Michael Caine for Harry Brown? I'm oh, definitely going to elevate him in this one. Fairly cookie cutter. You know, we've seen it before, Revenge Flick, but it's Michael Caine taking it to the next level. I did have to apply our A View to a Kill formula here and say, is he better than Roger Moore in A View to a Kill? And I couldn't say he was, but I could say they were on par. So he's a seven for me in this movie. I bumped him up a little. I gave him I won't fight you. I won't fight you. <laughs> I appreciated. He played an action hero at his age. Right. Nothing was easy for him. <laughs> no. And he had to be smart. He had to be strategic. Physically, he couldn't outmatch any of these kids, but he was smart. He was a combat veteran, and he didn't fight fair. <laughs> I mean, appreciated that. And the one time when he had to try to chase that kid down, <laughs> that kid could have run backwards, like moonwalked and got away from him. And old Michael Caine, he's looking at, like me, at the end of a two-mile run. <laughs> <laughs> my heart going down i like that aspect of it so yeah that did add a bit of of realism to it that helped where i thought roger moore was an old man trying to play a young man you know trying to be like a young man i think they had an old man here and they played him like an old man and i appreciated that old man did not lose a step on his marksmanship skills man nope (laughs) nope (laughs) He popped old boy in that car before anybody knew what was going on. I didn't even know. I was like, oh, who shot him? Who shot him? (laughs) (laughs) Did Harry Brown make that shot from that range with a pistol? He did. (laughs) I'm like, if I'm that gang, I'm like, you know what? We're moving out. There are plenty of other tunnels we can have sex and smoke weed in. (laughs) Well, we got the scores in, but we have one little bit of business. Kathy, it seems like once again... The nod is going to an older Michael Caine and Harry Brown, but you can uh, sway the score a little bit. No, you're right. I'm going to give my sniper bullet to Harry Brown. As we discussed, it's a little confusing exactly who the hero of Kidnapped is. I mean, it's titled a Michael Caine movie, but the other guy's story is really what we're supposed to be following. So we're going to go with Harry Brown. Sounds good. Wrapping it up, passing it back to you, Jared. All right, let's get into round three. If you're up to me, I'd just kill you. Round three is the villain. How interesting is your villain? How compelling is your villain? Let's find out. We start with Jason this time and Kidnap 1971. There's not really a clear villain here. I mean, you can make an argument that it's Alan Breck who's the villain. Basically, he's still fighting for a lost cause, a cause that his countrymen have given up, and he just can't let go. You can make an argument that it's Bonnie Prince Charles who's fomenting all this from the comfort of France. We never see him. And I think the the one character who got arrested, the the young lady's father, put it best. He's like, we lost because we couldn't eat for two days. You know, I hear Prince Charles was eating pretty well, you know, and uh, didn't see him on this battlefield anywhere. So there's not really a clear villain. I don't think there's really meant to be. I think it's just the world is a harsh and dangerous place. And our boy Balfour is learning that and becoming a man in this this environment. I know that's a meek answer, but that's all I got. Yeah, the villainy is a bit odd in this one. Kathy? I completely agree with Jason. There really isn't a clear villain. Could be Michael Caine. Could be the Redcoats killing all the... Scottish Highlanders could be the Stuarts trying to recapture the throne. So it's a little too vague for my taste. All right, let's shift gears. Harry Brown had some pretty clear villains. Jason. Punk kids had to go, man. I'd say that probably the villainy is kind of the weakest aspect of this movie, just because it's one of those situations where these kids are so just 
irredeemably bad <laughs> that you don't really have much objection to Harry Brown doing what he has to do. And you're kind of wondering, like, why aren't the police doing doing more here? I will say the one thing that kind of saved it for me was Sid the bartender there at the end. That was kind of a little bit of a twist how much he was mixed up in it. I guess maybe Sid was kind of the, I don't know if he was the brains of the operation, but he definitely was profiting off this situation where a bunch of people were preying on on the elderly and the weak. And it was a little shocking to find Sid had such an active part in it in the third act. But I'll stop there. Yeah. The first note I wrote when I was um, taking notes on this movie, Noel is a real piece of shit. <laughs> These kids were awful. And like you said, they had to make the movie hard to watch. We had to want these kids to not be around anymore and in the most permanent way possible. <laughs> if they would have been half as villainous as they were, we wouldn't have cared. Oh, just move them to a different town. But we needed them out of the picture, right? So I think they yeah. they did an incredible job of making us all hate them. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, but yes, I agree. The, the twist of Sid, the bartender, I'll talk about him and a couple other people in the spectacle round, but I think that did add a good twist. And it's like, wait, what do you mean that that's his nephew? I think is what it was. Yeah. Yeah. That was an interesting twist. Mm -hmm. So did a good job with uh, the villainy work in this movie. Yeah. I thought it was all right. I really like Kathy's point about, they really make you hate, <laughs> hate those kids. So that was some good acting. I never understand about these movies is like the cop lady who's kind of figured it all out or, any movie like this, like another one I think about is The Punisher, where Lou Gossett Jr. is kind of the 89 Punisher, where Lou Gossett Jr. is figured out what Dollar is doing. And they're like trying to stop him. I got to tell you right now, if I was that cop, I'd be like, I have no clue who's doing this. This is a mystery to us all. <laughs> I would lie and lie and lie some more. <laughs> well, it's like when her partner Hitchcock there, before they go out into the riots to stop Harry Brown. Yeah, he was like, he's like, <laughs> He's well, doing a favor. <laughs> and and his decision to actually back her up, like he changes his mind and goes and gets him killed. You yeah. know, so man, that was my least favorite part of the movie, too, because like she's not even unconscious. She's like just laying there, kind of, oh, I got I think she got shot in the arm or something or something like that, or cut or something like that in the arm. And she's like, Oh, and she just watches this dude choke him out. I'm like, come on, now's my partner. I'm putting a little more effort into yeah. I'm not gonna just lay there and be sad. I'm not going to be sad. <laughs> that, was yeah. a that was a weird part for me because when she first, when they first got in there, when she's sitting there and she's like holding her neck the whole time, like she's been shot in the neck. But then after he hits her over the head and like she's down on the floor, then she's holding the other side of her neck. I'm like, I'm confused. She just had <laughs> neck issues that day. Apparently. She slept wrong. <laughs> I took it as she probably had a concussion too. She, she I, I I would hope so because I was like, You are putting zero effort. You're just watching this dude die and being sad about it. Like I would literally do everything, everything I could to save that dude. But I anyways. I would assume that one of the first things you learn in training is how to break free of someone who's choking you. But I, I could yeah, be wrong. Yeah, it's yeah. it's uh, pretty early on in the classes I taught, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, Jason, let's go back to Kidnap 1971, Villainy. It's a weird one. Where are you going to land? I'm going to land on a five. I don't think we really have a good, credible villain in this thing. Again, I think the world is just a harsh place, and our protagonist is learning some life lessons along the way. Match game number four. Now, you know me. If you, My policy in the show is if I can't tell you who the villain is, you get like a four or lower. So we came this close to, in this, but then I was like, the one guy who was a villain, clearly, and was played by Donald Pleasance, yes, that'll, Donald. that'll get you to the five. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized we had two Blofelds in this movie. That's <laughs> right. We have the voice of a Blofeld and an actual, an Blofeld. actual Blofeld. <laughs> so anyway, right. so yeah, fives from the both of us on that. Let's go to Harry Brown, 2009, one to 10, Jason. I'm going to give that one a, a six. It kind of like way back when we did the dirt, one of the Dirty Harry movies. I think it's the Enforcer. It's just like give us the worst people in the world and let our protagonist just go to town. <laughs> and that's kind of what we did here. I will say that Sid the bartender keeps it from a 
five for me. I'm put him in six territory. Yeah, six seems fair. And that's match game number five. So Kathy has to root against us for the rest of the show. because She's got us a five for this one. I gave him a six because of what Kathy mentioned. The actors did such a good job, especially that lead guy, the nephew. Oh, yeah. Of just making you hate him. Ugh. So I was like, that's a good performance. Like, when I think of this movie, that's who I'm going to think of. And I, yeah, I thought, me too. Well, I'm like, he really did not like him. All right, Kathy, you have one sniper bullet to give. Which movie had better villains? I think that is probably the easiest sniper choice I have ever had. Bullet is going to go to the ruthless, horrible children <laughs> that is the villains of Harry Brown. That's the end of round three. All right, let's get into the fun stuff. Let's talk about the spectacle, the overall spectacle. Is that your best? How engaging is this film overall? The stunts and the action sequences, the cinematography, the soundtrack, the score, all that good stuff. Jared, let's talk a little bit about Kidnapped. What are your thoughts there? Kidnapped is going to end here with a little bit of strength in these next two rounds, to be honest with you. Spectacle was strong here in two specific places. Music was good and serviceable. Nothing really stands out in my head. But the two strongest places, cinematography. Man, there was some beautiful shots of the countryside. It was popping. Oh, my good. Their color palettes were great. The cinematography really lifts this movie. We, I think last month we covered Kelly's Heroes, and I kind of felt the same way. The beautiful countryside and and all that stuff. It, it really looked nice. And the other place, Kathy mentioned it, wardrobe. Everybody's outfits were balling as well. Man. So it gets a really strong cinematography and wardrobe as far as spectacle goes. I would say the biggest thing keeping me from checking my phone, although I did check my phone a little bit more in the second half when I was like, listen, I'm not going to ever figure out this history lesson. Uh, so... <laughs> The one thing that did keep me coming in eyes back to the screen was how good the cinematography was. So, yeah, I, it's going to get a decent score for that. Oh, I agree. And a little piece of nostalgia for me. A lot of that was filmed in Edinburgh Castle in the third act. And I'd been there, so I recognized several of those places. And, and I've been to the Highlands. Uh, so there's a whole lot of nostalgia that was pulling on the old heartstrings here for me as well. Kathy, what are your thoughts on the spectacle of Kidnapped? It definitely is the best part of this movie. I will say that. One, the costumes are incredible. Two, the landscape, incredible. Three, they even filmed some of these scenes in the same location that Outlander is filmed in. The little square that they went to had the column and the cute little white buildings with the little wooden windows. Mm -hmm. That's also in Outlander. I'm like, that looks very familiar. So kind of like you said with nostalgia, that brought that back for me because of Outlander. The only <laughs> annoying part was her costume, the way they edited it. She miraculously changed costumes halfway through. When they leave that house, I guess it's her house, the steward yes. house. She has a beautiful plaid dress on, full plaid top to bottom. The front's split open so you can see her white, you know, underskirt under her dress. When they arrive at the cottage where the family's been killed, she has a caramel brown and then a dark gray brown skirt, not split up the middle. It's not plaid. Earlier, she had a very red toned scarf. This was just a brown plaid scarf she had on. Kathy, then, I've never known a woman to take just one outfit on a trip. <laughs> well, I, I want to say... because No, I, I know what you're going to say, and that's not true, because that happens later when he offers her the clothes. Yes. Later on, okay. that's after they get to the caves. This is before they get to the caves. Mm. And then later on, after they leave the cottage where the family was killed and they're on the run again, mm -hmm. she's got the plaid dress on again. So anyway, that's just continuity gets on my nerves a little bit when it's not proper. We do call you continuity, Kathy, over on the Sherlock Holmes <laughs> show. So that's true. There you go. So that was just my biggest bugaboo about that. But yes, definitely best part of this movie was spectacle. Well, all right. Let's switch films here and go over to Harry Brown and see what Jared's thoughts are on the spectacle there. It's like the other side of the same coin, right? Where Kidnapped is just gorgeous and depicts the greatest parts of the United Kingdom. <laughs> the other side of that coin 
is grimy, the darkest parts that you don't want to know about, puts it on the screen. You know, it kind of reminded me of another film where we actually gave it a plus because it was griminess, which was the Warriors, right? That's right, yeah. Because you kind of need the grime to sell the story. So it has the spectacle from the other side of the coin. You know, we're all kind of fascinated by that darker, seedier side of things. And one of the things I thought they did specifically really well was they really sold the menace of the tunnel. Yeah. Right? Like, very much. I could probably sketch that tunnel from memory just because everybody who's about to walk down that dang thing has to think about it, has to give it a second thought. And I think at the very end of the movie, he's actually just rolls right into that tunnel because he's like, I clean this shit out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this my tunnel now. Spickety span at this point, you know. <laughs> But it does a good job of that. It does a good job overall just capturing the seediness. It does almost too good of a job. I am 100% uncomfortable the entire time he's there trying to buy the gun from the skeevy, skinny dude and the drug addicts. And he, the dude's shooting up. And he's got this video on of him having sex with a girl who doesn't even know she's having sex. It's disgusting. Everything is disgusting and grimy. And on one hand, I just want to turn it off. And on the other hand, I'm just like, well, they have sold me on how awful this is. Yes. Again, I mentioned it earlier. This movie is hard to watch. It is hard to watch. And that's, in a weird way, almost a plus because they don't hold back. Yeah. No, I agree. 100%. Yeah, that is an uncomfortable moment that you you just described. Yeah, but when, it's he, in- when he kills, oh boy, it's so satisfying. <laughs> oh, I don't know. You're almost like, what took you so long? Yeah, like, really? You should have popped this fool a while ago. <laughs> like, four sentences back. Holy cow. And you this... wouldn't have got that cool scene where he's like, you know, I've never told anybody this before. Yep. I got the perfect person to tell right here. Because you're going through this injury, and I want to <laughs> unload it. So, <laughs> And you're not going anywhere. You're got, so. well, you, well, you're going somewhere. but <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, yeah, dark. Very dark. And it's interesting, too, because, like, his apartment is kind of like this little nirvana within this whole mess of chaos. Just fascinating. Anyway, what do you think, Kathy? It is considered a spectacle because, like y'all say, it sold us on how grimy and how scary this city is or this town is that people are trying to live in and have families in. And there's a park near and So they definitely did a good job. As far as another part of spectacle I'd like to talk about that I was going to mention earlier is I absolutely love the fact that three of the actors in this movie are all from Game of Thrones. (laughs) That's right. So I love that part to me that adds to the spectacle. The police captain, he plays a huge role in Game of Thrones. Sid, the bartender. He's a huge part of Game of Thrones. Actually, they all three are. They're big, like, mm-hmm. they're in all, at least eight of the ten seasons, if not all ten. So, I love that part. That made me enjoy it, even if one of them was a villain. The third one was Leonard, right? The guy who played Leonard? Yeah, his best friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Just checking my notes here. Zero actors from Airwolf. <laughs> 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 and the funny thing is, the guy who was his best friend, who was the nicest man in this movie is the worst one from the Game of Thrones world. He was awful in Game of Thrones. I only know from Harry Potter. That's true. Yeah, he's from Harry Potter, too. He's like the janitor. With the, with oh, the cat. <laughs> <laughs> he's mean to those kids, so he's a villain in that movie, too. He's he's mean to those, hateful to those kids at the beginning. So I agree with Spectacle. They definitely sell it for what it's worth. Well, it sounds like we are all leaning pretty heavy in the Spectacle category for both of these films, kind of for opposite reasons. Let's go ahead and score them. Jared, what are you giving the spectacle for Kidnapped? Well, it did lose my attention a couple of times. Like I said, what kept bringing me back was beautiful cinematography and cool costumes. So much so, I'm willing to give it a seven. I I just really liked its look a whole lot. I agree, and that's where I landed as well. I mean, there's really only one big baller action scene at the beginning of the movie, and it's really cool. That fight scene was really good. I like how they did that. It was very violent, but they filmed it... Such angles and such that kept it that that G or PG rating that they were going for. But the rest of it, there was a lot of thrilling chase moments through the, the Scottish countryside as well. Again, the cinematography just kind of takes your breath away. Great locations. So seven for me as well. 
What are you giving Harry Brown? Seven. <laughs> it's the other side of the coin, but seven still. Same. I felt felt the same going in. I thought the action elements, it's not a lot, a lot of bang, bang, shoot them up, but what there is is really intense. And again, props to the director and to Michael Caine as an actor for really giving a, a realistic performance. Like I, I bought those action scenes. They didn't oversell him as a superhero. Yeah, those kids had it coming. So, <laughs> so seven for me as well. So we're we're locked up tied here, Kathy. So your bullet's gonna decide who wins this category. This is probably the toughest category, but also the easiest. Harry Brown was spectacle in the sense of it had a better story, definitely had more action, and I take that for what it's worth. But visually, I just enjoyed watching kidnapped more not that i enjoyed it more but i enjoyed watching it more so i'm gonna give my sniper bullet to kidnapped on this round well there you have it it's all wrapped up and i'm gonna pass it over to you jared for round five all right let's do round five i'm going to kill them all sir round five is best action scene we're gonna take a look at what kidnapped and harry brown has to offer via jason's clever witticisms and We'll make some decisions. Jason, let's start with Kidnap 1971. We've kind of alluded to the fact that there's like one really strong scene. What you got for us? Well, peek behind the curtain. We're going to be doing this in real time because I did not come quite prepared for this. But when I think of Kidnapped and I think of the spectacle, I'm thinking of the action scene that we're all going to give it to. The big battle in the ship in the opening. And I think we could call that one, I'm going to kick you in the coxswain. <laughs> nautical humor there you go there we go <laughs> i like it okay well the two other ones i can think of is really kind of a ensemble of the chase through the countryside where they're getting shot at the kind of that little battle at the house so I'll call that was the them. other one i thought of too <laughs> <laughs> there's also there's a little bit of the one where he kills the two soldiers that killed the family at the cottage i don't know if that's really considered an action scene or not but yeah, I guess we could count that. Well, you could probably wrap that one all into one scene, I would think. Yeah. To give it a little bit of a chance against the opening scene. Get some vengeance on the soldiers and the shootout at the house and the getaway. We'll call that one uh, Candy Graham for Sergeant Mongo. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was the name of the guy who shot. Was Mongo. 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 Well done. Mongo so, Campbell. There we go. So, which one's your favorite? I think we all know. <laughs> I'm going to go with, I'm going to kick you in the coxswain. Oh, absolutely. That was so baller the way the dude was like, reload these pistols and like, we got to come from all these different angles. And, and young man was kind of on top of his game. Yeah. Watch the skylight. Watch, watch the, skylight, the skylight. You know, like they took on a much superior force and won. But he was not watching the skylight. <laughs> no, he didn't do great watch. <laughs> Kathy, cool. what's your action scene? Is it the same one, I assume? To be honest, I really wouldn't consider anything in it very action oriented. <laughs> I will say it. That scene kind of annoyed me just because you could tell how fake the hits were. <laughs> like when they were supposed to be slashing them with the swords and everything. I'm like, that is so fake. But <laughs> it's definitely, I guess, really the, the main action scene. So we'll go with that as the favorite. Sounds like she wants blood. So looks yeah. like it, things are looking good for Harry Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, Jason, what do we got over there? I think the first big one is when he goes to get the gun. That scene that made us all uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, at the house. Gross. Mm -hmm. I think I'll call that one, I think I just Harry Brown my pants. <laughs> <laughs> Good riddance to bad rubbish, man. Yeah, no kidding. I think the next big action scene really is the tunnel, when he had the shootout in the tunnel, when he when he leads the guy in there. I'll call that one tunnel, <laughs> tunnel of love. Well, they were making love in there. Yeah. Time to shoot up your tunnel of love, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> And then finally, I think the third one would be the final scene in the bar. And I'll call that one Last Call, Mother There you go. So you can edit one out. Yeah, I always have one. I guess. There you go. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about which one we like best. Kathy, what do you think? You like the killing of the dude in the weed house? You like the uh, tunnel action? You like the final scene at the bar? What do you got? Last Call, Mother <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jason. Just for variety's sake, I'm going to go Tunnel of Blood. 
And just to keep the variety, I'll go with killing the dude at the skeevy pot house because it's so satisfying. <laughs> What's that it is. It is. I mean, all three of these are pretty baller scenes. Uh, yeah. None of them are like big or, you know, over the top. They're all kind of subtle. And they're, I guess the biggest one probably the tunnel or maybe the final. <laughs> well, all we can do is go back and score them. Jason, we both really like that fight on the boat at the beginning of the kidnap it was definitely i think the highlight of the whole movie for me i could watch i could go back and watch that scene standalone and just really enjoy it so what are you gonna score it i'm gonna throw a seven on that i i get what kathy's saying you know but I, i'm gonna pay respect to the fact they're trying to keep this g or pg rated for what they had to work with i thought it was really good it just had a real great energy to it part of it is because he just met this guy <laughs> And it's like, you got to make a decision right now, man. Right. <laughs> Let's go. And I'm at a seven match game. Match game all day. Let's go to Harry Brown. We all, they're all great. You pick the tunnel. I did pick the tunnel. What are you gonna give that? I'm going to give that a seven as well. Like I said, I mean, it's, it's not a, a diehard type shootout, but boy, that is just tense. And then when the way that, that Noel gets away at the end is really like, ah, I really wanted, wanted Noel to die in that moment. I don't know. I'm going to give that one a seven. Match games all over, man. We ended up matching nine times on this episode. I also gave it a seven. So it's all locked up. It's up to Kathy to decide which movie she thought had better action scenes. I could probably guess, but why don't you reveal? When it comes down to just the word action... I'm going to obviously have to go with Harry Brown. All right. That's the end of round five. Well, that just leaves round six. It's time to die. The deduction round. Do we have any airing of grievances? Are we going to minus anything here, Jared, for kidnapped? I considered it because I was like, it just got confusing at the end. But then I realized it's because I'm not smart. So I can't really get it on this one because I don't know the history. But I think you made a good point. I think it's probably easier to read that history than to display it on film because it, it did not land with me. But, uh, hey, I'm going to let it go. No deductions. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. It's not their fault that I'm too lazy to read. So no deductions for me <laughs> either. What about Harry Brown, Jared? You seem like you were you really churned your stomach. The level of depravity of, yeah. of, the, of these kids, did they go too far in the movie? I'm yeah, wondering? I mean, gosh, you, the way they spoke to that especially the female cop well to all the cops especially her you know the things they did to that old man i mean they peed on him man on the, they videoed it and it was just like that poor girl on the couch it was disgusting uh i won't take away any points though because it's you know kind of supposed to be but it's not going to be high on my rewatch films it's gonna be like okay i think i've seen it i'm good <laughs> you know and uh, i'll call it a day so I'll, I'll leave this one alone as well yeah definitely more fun moments with kidnapped than we had with Harry Brown. But mm. I agree with you. I, I mean, I think this is one that if they had done this differently, I could see myself taking a point off because it's like, oh, that is so unrealistic, this action scene, this 76-year-old Michael Caine doing this type of stuff. But they really took great pains to keep this ultra-realistic. So my hat's off to them there. Absolutely. I kind of heard... Uh, maybe some grievance coming from Kathy. Are we? Are, are we going to? Uh, we, we heard about the dress, so the change of clothes was bothering you. Anything else? Any other area grievances from either of the movies? No, I mean that that was really my biggest annoyance. I can't think of anything else. I mean, like Jared said, it with Harry Brown, it is difficult. But like I said, I think it had to be that way for us to have the visceral. Is that the word I want to use? I think visceral works. Resp perfectly. Response and that we wanted Harry to take them out. So no, take no, them out, no, Harry. No, yeah, no real grievances. All right, all right. Well, that's it, Jared. I think it's time for you to do math. I think you're right. That's the end of our official rounds. Now, don't you worry if you haven't been keeping up with the math at home, folks. We do that for you at Action Film Face Off. Taking a look at Match Game, as I mentioned earlier, Jason, I matched 9 out of 10. I think we've only had one perfect match in the history of the show. We came close today. I was surprised because just by your reaction, initial reaction, when we talked about kidnapped, I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm envisioning lots of fives and sixes. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. 
And looking at the sniper bullets, Kathy gave four of her five bullets to Harry Brown and one to Kidnap for those beautiful countryside shots, I do believe. And of course, looking at the judges' scorecards, the winner of this episode, action film face-off with a score of 73 to 63, is Harry Brown. Congratulations to Harry Brown. Now let's head over to the randomizer and find out what the years are going to be for our next episode. My brother Jared will be pulling a film from... Choose Your Destiny. Two thousand five, and I will bring a film from Choose Your Destiny. Two thousand eighteen. Oh, we're in the two thousands this time. What will those films be? We'll tease them on social media for those of you who want to watch before listening. We're thinking of you, Dave. Or you can tune in next episode to find out. Until then, I'm Jason Weasel Skull Albrick, and you can find me on social media. At Jason Albrick, Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. And you can find me, Jared Albrick, the Yard Sale Artist, a.k.a. Death Probe, at X, Facebook, Instagram. You can check out my artwares at www.theyardsaleartist.com. Kathy, where can people find you? I can be found on all the grams, all the social medias, at aukathy2418, and that's Kathy with a K. Be sure to check out all the shows under the Longbox Crusade umbrella by subscribing to Longbox Crusade on any of your finer podcatchers. And, of course, on YouTube, where you can check us out directly at www.longboxcrusade.com. If you want to send us a question or a comment, you can do that by hitting us up on social media at Longbox Crusade. That's on X, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. It's all at Longbox Crusade. We're also at AFFO Podcast on X, so it's a little bit more direct uh, but you can do it either way. Longbox Crusade or AFFO Podcast. Either way, I'll get you there. But the most fun is if you leave us a voicemail. 707-532-5269. Give us a call. Tell us what you think about Kidnapped or Harry Brown. Or hell, give us a call and tell us what you think the best Michael Caine action movie ever was. It's probably Miss Congeniality, I guess. Anyway. <laughs> and come and tell everybody that Kathy's your favorite sniper and not Dave. Yeah, voicemails of, of battling over who your favorite sniper is, totally acceptable. It's Kathy versus Dave, 707-532-5269, 707-532-LBOX. Boy, pick up the phone. Pick up the phone. Got the British versions tonight, I love it. Thanks for tuning in, we appreciate you listening. Until next episode, keep your head down and, and your, your knuckles, knuckles up. up. The intro and outro theme to this show and all of our action film face-off shows are done by musical genius Joe November. Check out his SoundCloud at J-O-S-E-F-L-I-N-9-9. You will not regret it. All right, here we go. We're going to crucify old Peachy. <laughs> That's a deep cut for some people. All right. The man who will be king reference, right? Very good. <laughs> no kidding. I was trying to think, is there something you could say about the pot? Because there was, that's where, because he died in the, in the room with all the, the pot plants, the marijuana plants, didn't he? He did. Yeah. I got nothing right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, 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 he did die in the greenhouse. He had his highs and lows. <laughs> oh, <my goodness. laughs> oh man. Brown house meet greenhouse. <laughs> what else you got? <laughs> All right. I can't say deduction. The deduction round. It's you the minus round. it. I might it's time to minus it, folks. What's going down, my brown? You're the best. All right. Round. Your name is Harry Brown. I'm so proud of myself for not accidentally saying Harry Balls through this whole episode. I definitely won't put that on the outtakes reel. No, stop it. <laughs> She's going to blow him away. You're supposed to let me finish it off. And Jared, I want you to know that you are not a weirdo.